New York, August 15, 1914, First World War. The Fourth Fleet, pride of the Royal Navy, has just weighed anchor. In a few weeks, the expeditionary force of the 13 colonies will land in Europe, ready to defend the motherland, the British Empire. In the 20th century, the United Kingdom is a great colonial power. From America to Asia, the Union Jack flies over every continent. During the last century, she created the vastest empire in the history of humanity. The huge statue of Her Majesty Queen Victoria stands triumphant at the entrance to New York Bay, reminding all of the power of the British crown. But none of this ever happened. In 1759, a tiny grain of sand will decide the fate of New France and change the face of the world. Our history is no more than a series of incredible events. Every one of us can influence its course. The most infinitesimal of our decisions can influence the future of humanity. To know the past is to foresee the future. July 1534, Jacques Cartier, a French explorer, has just made contact with the Amur Indians in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. May 28, 1754, George Washington, a British militiaman, carries out a surprise attack on a French embassy in the Ohio Valley. September 18, 1759, at the end of a long siege, Quebec, capital of New France, falls into the hands of the British crown. These three events are key moments in the history of New France. They will lead to the creation of Canada. Newfoundland, Viking encampment. The colony has just survived its first winter. We are 500 years before Christopher Columbus's voyage, and the Scandinavian explorers are the first Europeans to set foot on the continent of North America. A land of abundance, roaming with mighty herds of bison and caribou, covered as far as the eye can see with vast forests, crisscrossed by rivers teeming with fish and beaver. The north of America suffers from extreme climate conditions. Winter lasts five months, and temperatures can drop to lower than minus 40 degrees. And yet, in the 16th century, daring adventurers will set out to explore its coasts and then its interior. May 10th, 1534. French explorer Jacques Cartier arrives within sight of the great island of Newfoundland for his first expedition in the name of Francois I, King of France. During his voyages, he will first explore the coasts and then venture up one of the greatest rivers of the world, the St. Lawrence. But although he was one of the first Europeans to explore these territories, he is far from being the first man to set foot there. For over 10,000 years, the Amur Indians have inhabited the continent. They are then some hundreds of thousands, divided into tribes, nations, and confederations. In contrast to the Spanish conquistadors with the Aztecs a few years earlier, relations between the French and the natives will remain generally amicable. This peaceful entente is the keystone of the future French colony and is unique in the history of America. What's more, from hearing the natives constantly inviting him to their village, which they call Canata, Cartier decides to use the word to name the region. This is the first appearance of the word Canada. Trade is rapidly established between Amur Indians and Europeans. Beaver pelts for rifles, clothing, or pots. The trappers' camps gradually turn into small trading posts. Colonists begin to settle permanently. But living conditions are testing for the French, accustomed to a gentler climate. Two out of every three colonists give up and return to France after the first winter. The others adapt. 
They are now no longer completely French. They become Canadians. July 3rd, 1608. After several disastrous attempts, the embryo of a city rises from the earth on the banks of the St. Lawrence River. This spot, a strategic one because located on the main trading route for skins and at the precise point where the river narrows, is well known to the natives. They call it Quebec. Welcome to the memory of humanity. Here, we can control time, analyze and compare billions of events and alter them to rewrite history endlessly. All the events in our history, however minute they might be, are memorized and interconnected. It only requires one to be changed for all the others to be shaken to the core. For example, let's go back to the 17th century and compare the Amerindian and European ways of life. In both cases, the peoples are heirs to a culture thousands of years old. Linguistic differences between the Huron of the Great Lakes and the Mi'kmaq of the St. Lawrence are as great as those between the English and the Germans. And the same applies to their cultures and eating habits. As in Europe, the Amerindian nations forge alliances and frequently go to war. However, Amerindian societies are more egalitarian. Social and community life, collective property, and equality between all, regardless of age, sex, or filiation. We are a long way from the caricature of the noble savage. Early 18th century. In a century of living together, the French Canadians have learned a lot from the Amerindians. The colonists have made ever deeper inroads into the country, mainly using the river network. They are now called runners of the woods. They are hardy and can run for hours over hill and forest, are sharpshooters, often speak several native languages and marry with the natives. They will map almost half of the North American continent, giving the regions they pass through the names of the tribes who live there. Ohio, Missouri, Illinois, or Wisconsin. A century after it was founded, the tiny trading post of Quebec is now a city of 9,000. It has been through tough times, extraordinarily harsh winters, famine, and war with the Iroquois. Along with Montreal and Louisbourg, Quebec is one of the principal cities of the royal colony of New France. But for the crown, Canada costs a lot and brings in little. Under Louis XV, the more profitable sugar islands of the Caribbean take preference. Furthermore, the colony is icebound half of the year, which interrupts trade and makes it complicated to provision. In the metropole, the future of these few acres of snow is far from being a priority. For the United Kingdom, it's quite the opposite. Great Britain is an island. In order to grow, it is forced to look outwards. Very quickly, an imperialist policy is born in London. British possessions in America are not merely trading posts. They are above all, new territories to occupy, exploit, and defend. And that is how in the 17th century, waves of colonists founded New England. Setting out with their possessions and their families, they have no intention of returning. Driven from England by religious persecution, they are carried along by the conviction that they must establish a purer society. Henceforth, the Amerindians, regarded as an embarrassment, are fought and driven out. In 1750, the 13 British colonies have more than a million inhabitants, and they are expanding fast. The French Canadians are barely 70,000 on a territory at least five times greater. 
between dynamic British colonies and underpopulated Franco-Amerindian territories, competition is more present than ever. Adapt or disappear. In America, the English colonists import their way of working and impose it on the Amerindians. The French, in a minority and in a hostile environment, adapt and treat them as equals. They know that the survival of their country depends on their relations with their allies. Rather than fight a pitched battle, costly in men, they prefer the skirmish, ambushes, raids, stealthy movement and fighting in the forest. The Canadians call it little war, a sort of guerrilla warfare. And it's a hunt, a manhunt. Move from tree to tree to remain covered, shoot only when sure of hitting your target, only emerge from hiding to fire, and then attack hand to hand. The British Army, however, had conserved its fighting tactics. But it does have an ace, its discipline. In a fixed battle, it is able to fire continuously. One line of soldiers fires while the preceding line reloads. Guerrilla against firepower. It's the same plan as that adopted by the Afghan Mujahideen against the Soviet army in the 20th century. May 28, 1754. This day marks the end of the status quo. British militiamen carry out a surprise attack on a French embassy. Leading them is the young George Washington, the future first president of the United States of America. The execution of the French ambassador is the declaration of a war that will impact on every continent, the Seven Years' War. France and England, the two great powers of the period, will confront each other on land and sea, in Europe and in their colonies. From the beginning, England plays its trump card. The Royal Navy deploys across the ocean. Its mission, destroy the French Navy, block her ports, prevent her from getting aid to her colonies. In short, paralyze the realm. The Navy, with fearsome efficiency, manages to cut off France's arms. The French colonies are now left to their own devices. In New France, it looks to be a difficult fight. Canada is then governed by the Marquis of Vaudreuil, a Canadian born in Quebec, he favors the Little War. For two years, militia and Amer Indians have inflicted defeat after defeat on the English troops. The French are masters of the terrain. But now he has to work with the commander of the Royal Armies, the Marquis of Montcalm, recently arrived from France. The latter, enjoying the same hierarchical level as Vaudreuil, has no taste for this inglorious form of warfare, but he quickly learns to use it effectively. The combined force of the regular troops and the Canadian militia is a redoubtable one. The English forts fall to the French shelling while their patrols walk into ambushes set by the Canadian militia. From the banks of the Hudson to the snow-covered slopes of Lake Champlain, the English troops are shoved and harassed from all sides. But on the seas, the Royal Navy rules supreme. On July 27, 1758, Louisbourg, key to New France, falls into the hands of the English. French reinforcements are arriving only in dribs and drabs, whereas the British troops are increasingly numerous. The fight is close. Montcalm knows that he will finally be overwhelmed and begs for reinforcements. But France is also fighting battles on the continent. No one will come to the rescue of New France. On June 4th, 1759, a formidable fleet of English warships leaves Louisbourg and heads for Quebec. On board are nearly 2,000 cannon and 22,000 soldiers and seamen. The battle for Quebec is about to begin. Control of the seas. 
During the conflict, the Royal Navy is everywhere and wins almost all its battles. Its superiority is crushing. Sailing powerful vessels with two or three decks, armed with batteries of cannon, it controls the oceans. The key to its success lies in its iron discipline, constant training and effective logistics. Whereas the French sailors only put to sea to do battle, the English are almost constantly at sea training. In the same space of time, their crews managed to fire three rounds of cannon to a single one from the French. Whereas in France, ship's captain is often regarded as a mere title, the British captains are promoted on merit, are effective and hardened by naval combat. The spirit of initiative, daring and speed are the keystones to the Royal Navy. Its motto, if you want peace, prepare for war. In our day, its only equivalent would be the military supremacy of the United States, the only country capable of delivering considerable firepower to the far side of the globe. Quebec, early 1759. The French commanders don't agree. Governor Vaudreuil wants to defend the entire territory. Military commander Montcalm considers it to be lost and withdraws the majority of his troops to Quebec. He has 15,000 men under his orders. The fight is still far from lost, especially as navigation on the St. Lawrence is almost impossible for those who don't know the river. But aboard the British flagship, General James Wolfe holds a crucial ace highly accurate French marine charts. On June 26, against all expectations, the English warships sail past Orleans Island and into sight of Quebec. The city is immediately besieged. The French troops, having vainly attempted to set fire to the enemy ships, entrench in their positions. On the 29th, the English step ashore on the opposite bank. Cannons are set up in a battery and soon begin to pound the city. Mid-July, a part of the British fleet braves the French cannons and moves upriver. The city is now exposed on two fronts. At the end of July, Wolfe launches a massive attack, but the English troops suffer heavy losses. The general now adopts a new strategy. He sends his rangers to ravage the hinterland. 1,400 farms are destroyed and burned. But the city, protected by its cliffs and its cannons, still does not surrender. Wolf has already lost many men. More seriously, winter is approaching and his fleet risks becoming trapped in the ice. He decides to risk everything. During the night of September 12th, after foiling the French sentries, he secretly disembarks a part of his troops to the west of the city. Reputedly impassable, the steep relief is Quebec's best defense. Disciplined and professional, the British soldiers begin the assault of the cliff. Overthrowing the French defenses, they gain a foothold on the summit and immediately form a battle line. Wolfe knows his position is precarious. Just one vigorous French counterattack could destroy him and his men. But the French fail to seize their opportunity. When Montcalm finally arrives to face the British on the place known as the Plains of Abraham, they are ready to fight, muskets loaded. They are a mere few thousand while Montcalm disposes of many more troops, but half of his men are more used to skirmishing than to pitched battle. Large numbers of French reinforcements are on the way. He only needs to wait a few hours to be sure of victory. This is when Montcalm takes a crucial decision. Anxious to see the enemy consolidate his positions, he decides not to wait any longer and launches the attack. The English line, impassable, holds firm. Even when the first French bullets hit their ranks, His Majesty's soldiers remain calm. They wait till the French, in disorder, come within range, till their muskets have been fired. Then, as one man, they aim and unleash hell. The volley is devastating. The French soldiers are cut down by a hail of lead. In a few minutes, the fate of the battle is sealed. 
the French line collapses. The regulars beat a retreat. From the woods, the Canadian militia riddle the British troops with lead and wreak havoc, but to no purpose. Two hours later, the battle is lost. We have just reached a turning point. A turning point is a key event, a crossroads in our history where the world swings one way or the other. By prematurely attacking a troop of disciplined soldiers, Montcalm is heading for failure. Demoralized, the inhabitants of Quebec surrender to the English troops. What would have happened if he had waited for reinforcement? if he had held the line and ordered his militia to harass the enemy soldiers. Once the reinforcements had arrived, he could have defeated the British and saved the city. Waging the little war, New France would have continued and would have retained part of its territory until the end of the war in Europe. With the French enemy still present on its borders, the English American colonies would probably not have sought their independence and would have remained loyal to the Crown. North America would have remained a territory shared by British and French, maybe even up until the dawn of the First World War. The outcome of the Battle of the Plains of Abraham was settled within minutes. The leaders of both camps, mortally wounded, do not survive. Five days later, the city of Quebec surrenders. The Canadians, cut off from the Kingdom of France, unable to provision them, will fight on for a few months with the energy of despair. But every British soldier killed is immediately replaced by two others. The Royal Navy is everywhere. After supporting them to the end, the last of the Amerindian allies abandoned the French, inescapable victims of a war already lost. On September 8, 1760, the capitulation of Montreal marks the end of New France. The Seven Years' War is a disaster for France, which loses a large part of her colonies, including all of her possessions in North America. When signing the Treaty of Paris in 1763, French diplomats preferred to save their islands in the Caribbean rather than the vast, ice-bound territories of Canada. The Canadians become British subjects. As a result, they must speak English and become Protestants. The Amerindians, deprived of their allies, now treat with the English. A century later, the United Kingdom, the big winner, will become an immense colonial empire, the greatest in the entire history of humanity. The 19th century will be British. The English language will become universal. But ironically, the end of a French presence in North America leaves the 13 English colonies with no enemies. A few years later, weighed down with taxes, the colonists will no longer see any interest in British sovereignty and will fight for their independence. The French, eager for revenge, will crush the British fleet in the Chesapeake Bay and win the war at the side of the American revolutionaries. Without her, the United States would never have seen the light of day. But that is another story. The world's face has changed. The Seven Years' War is the first conflict with global impact. All the European powers took part. Involving their respective colonies, the conflict spread across the world. At the end of the war, the cards are dealt again. By losing Canada, France leaves the field wide open. The British exploit the opportunity. The Anglo-Saxon language and culture gradually imposes itself there. Give or take 10 minutes, the time for a few musket volleys, and the opposite could have happened. Today, Canada is a flourishing, multicultural nation. At first marginalized, the French community is now perfectly integrated and is a full part of the nation. 
First Amerindian, then French, and finally English. The inhabitants of Canada have learned to live together. A blend of three cultures, they have been able to create their own identity. They have become Canadians.